Hello, CRX. I am David. I'm here with Yuri, and we're going to talk to Chris Abbott about his new Rob Hubbard book, Master of Magic. Chris, thanks for joining us again across the eight-hour time divide. It's always good to have you here. Yes. So Thank you. For those few Commodore viewers out there that have not heard of Mr. Abbott, uh, he's a music composer, arranger, and producer. Uh, he spent decades helping us all celebrate 80s chiptune music, and we're glad to have you here. I I think this is your first real big defining uh, effort back in, was it 1997, yeah. I think? Uh, I didn't even realize it was clouds. you. I, what's that? Complete with Clouds. Yes, Complete with Clouds. But, uh, your very first back in time CD. Um, but what's, what was that? Over a half a cent, uh, quarter of a century ago, right? beginning of 1998 i think people know you best today from your uh 8-bit symphony and that's where you and rob hubbard and other composers arranged commodore 64 game music for the complete symphony um i was you let me walk off with this after one of the recordings i still have this prominently displayed this is one of the <laughs> orchestral scores i mean look at all this so yeah. i gotta it, that's, that's that's being performed in mid-November in uh, Ealing uh, by the London Video Game Orchestra. Oh, coming up? Um, yeah, coming up mid-November, mid uh, November, uh, Saturday um, 16th, I think. Wow, do, so we have was... a, do we have a link for that? Um, not on me. Okay. We'll, we'll, find uh... link. We'll, make, we'll make that available. Great, great. That's awesome. So people no. will have an opportunity to perhaps snag a ticket still and go and see that. I'm sure that would be possible. They're they're, they're not ma they're not making it um, particularly prominent in the advertising that Monty on the Run is there, or indeed that Rob Hubbard will be there because I'm meeting wow. him uh, meeting him there. They're, they're really making, mostly concentrating on marketing the big names like Halo as usual. So. I once again, I've known you for a long time, and I cannot keep up with everything you're doing. <laughs> and I got this this pile. You can't see it here, but there's a pile of of Abbott creations behind me. Um, somebody should really take a picture of all the different Sid goodies you've created from all of your Kickstarters over the years. It would just be a gigantic pile. I was thinking of doing doing that and uh, sitting in the middle of it. That would be kind of a feature for the cool. age, wouldn't it? That would be cool. cool. Can you give us a brief description of what your latest book here is about? And then we can dive in from questions after that. It's basically a softography, an illustrated softography of the games that Rob Hubbard um, did music for. And um, each each um, each article has a, a, a usually a quite a meaty quote from Rob. Um, some context about the music and the game and the history of the game, um, some reviews, platforms that the music was ported to and comments about that, and also comments about the, how the driver had changed from the last game that he did, because the entire book is in chronological development order. So you can, you can sit on his, um, it's like you're sitting on his shoulder as he's doing the pieces and seeing the creative journey that he's making and what he's discovering, even down to the bite level. Yeah, I saw that chronological ordering here in the front. You have this multi-page timeline of uh, every piece. It's lovely, isn't it? It's Oh, it's absolutely <laughs> gorgeous. Yeah, one, of the things, one of the things I love about this also, you were talking about the changes to the music driver that he wrote. Um, in the end, you have this big... I mean, this may not appeal to everybody, it does me, this big deep dive of how all the driver works, you know, it's chock full of assembly goodness and stuff like that for people to study. So very cool. But it's, I think it's over 350 pages, something like that. 54, yes. Yeah, that's um, it's an absolutely gorgeous book. So it, it has some biography as well. It has the story of how he got started and nails that timeline into some kind of order and also covers what he did after he kind of retired from EA and or then how he um, integrated into the remix scene with Back in Time Lives or um, Back in Time Lives, 8-Bit Symphony, the, the Back in Time CDs. Um, so your so, book looks like the result of a massive 
crowdsourcing effort, but I think it's just mostly your weaponized OCD at work here. Um, is that right? Um, mostly, yeah, the, the uh, yeah the um, the contributions, the the massive numbers of people in contributing, uh, the the design, the screenshots, the media gallery, um, some help on the technical stuff. And uh, we really should note the media gallery for that, which is now 160 gigabytes and which includes not only every every tune he ever did on games, but every version of every tune he ever did, including all of the PC formats. That's a speaker, CMS, Sound Blaster, um, what's the, um, uh, Tandy, um, MT32 and, and GM. No, I saw it. It's, oh, go ahead, it's incredible. I, I, I think I think it started off like the initial release was like 120 gigabyte of goodies like this that grew another 40 gigabytes, which I really like about everything that you've been publishing has always been like an initial product that then grows. So once you once you actually become a proud owner of one of these things, you actually have something behind that that still is being worked on. And perfection, uh, perfection is never there. It feels like because you're always adding to it, which I think is just so cool. In that case, it was uh, that most of the extra was um, an AI enhanced uh, Rob Hubbard performance from Brighton, which right. had been taken to HD and then and then AI enhanced uh, right. because what well, it was originally recorded on DV tape. Okay, uh, for blue for DVD. So there was that. Um, a bit symphony. Um, there, there's a six year gap between when the art for back for A bit symphony one was created and now when some people have still ordered uh, ordered Blu rays for A bit symphony one. And in the intervening time, my daughter, who, did, who does the illustrations, has had six years of experience and is now graduated from university and looking for work. So she's redone all of the illustrations, um, and uh, the difference is quite stark over six years. As to so, it it's been a journey for her as much as for us. I mean, she did half of the illustrations for number two, and then after her coming came back to number one and just finished and redoing twenty of them, and you got uh, some absolutely lovely stuff. So, Chris, how does a project like this come about? How does it? Because I, I presume you, you, you and Rob have known each other for a long time. But I presume you didn't just phone him up and say, "Listen, Rob, I think it's time we're going to make a two hundred fifty page plus book about everything and anything you did." Well, actually, that's in the first volume. <laughs> <laughs> So there's another volume coming <laughs> out. You thought, just when you thought. <laughs> the second volume is called Spellbound. And the thing is, we've, we covered the games. And actually, if you think about, if you read the book, the music content hardly got a look in. It was all, it was, it was the circumstances about the music. There's a lot of why, a lot of who, a lot of what. Not very, actually not very much what, somehow. Mm -hmm. And there was an entire, he had an entire career before coming to the Commodore 64, which uh, I've got some really interesting stories about because he, he was basically a rock, a gigging rock and roller traveling around Europe and, and whatever. And it, it was the 70s. So you can imagine how wild that was. And he has some really nice stories about life on the road and that when he first went into a studio and discovered the, the joys of studio recording became a gearhead and that led him to the Commodore 64, which led him to Sid, which led him to lead us to now. Right. Um, but it was all to do with um, performing live and uh, um, the, the li and life as a musician. He, and he performed live for many years after he, uh, for, for decades after he, um, he always liked being in a band. Right. right. The, the most recent one, I think, before he stopped doing it was a Bruce Springsteen cover band. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that sounds like a very different kind of book. Um, it's seen... the same format, but it's it's covering the musical content and, and a further deep dive onto technical things like of how that was expressed, like vibrato. No, that's, that's great. I'm super excited. I'll, I'll help you proof the draft again. 
Yeah, at, at, what, at what moment in time did you start thinking about a second book like that? Because you're like in the midst of this this book, and once you start getting to a level of detail on one game, you kind of know, okay, now I've set the scene for what the rest of the book is going to look like. At what moment in time do you decide, like, I think there should be a second book, and we should go try and cover this as well? That, that was a... It was like the sound chip books I did, which was that you have a concept and you know what should be in the concept. And then that basically busts out of the, the single container you try to put it in and extends right. it into things. So right. you never sit down and say, yeah, I'm going to do a, a, a series of four books or a series of two books. You go, okay, this project is X and practical considerations, including page limits and times means I now have to make it in installments. Right. For, for um, people that don't know what the sound uh, chip books are, these are two of Chris's four sound chip books um, where he goes over all of the classic sound chips and all the games that showcased uh, their capabilities back in the day. These are also awesome. They are also very much looking like a crowdsource kind of thing. I've, I've seen you prepare for these projects before and you cast this extremely wide survey where you just gather everything possible first. It feels like you have a very bottom-up approach to your books when you write them that way. That's why this next book you're talking about seemed more maybe narrative or, or top-down driven. That's why I was thinking, saying it was a very different kind of book. It, well, it, at some point it was going to be a very different kind of book, but the format of the first one works so well mm. and provides yeah. such a nice container and people love sets anyway, so you have to have one that's exactly the same, but with a different title, don't you? Minor differences, same same feel. They sit together on a bookshelf. Yeah. And you can continue the same conversational narrative style. For instance, the, what, one of the things I'm planning to do is to sit down with Rob and have extended conversations about the games so that they, instead of getting a soundbite about the game, you get a lot more of the context and what Rob thinks about it, because that's the kind, that's the thing people are really buying the book for. They're not buying it for my musings. They're buying it for, you know, direct from the horse's mouth, recollections and authorized memories. Um, and that's what that's about. Well, oh, Chris, obviously... You also buy it for your expertise too. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chris, with that, uh, with the level of detail that you like to write in and, and, the audience that you're serving with that, eh? you've got an extremely geeky audience. You, you've written this, these, these four books on the sound chips. You couldn't get more geeky than that. And clearly people are loving this and they're eating it up. And the same, the same with the Rob Hubbard book. How do, you, how do you drag someone like a Rob Hubbard into that? Because for him, a lot of this is just his past and he may not have that much association with a geeky crowd out there that would love to read every nitty gritty detail that he may be able to recollect how do you get him how do you get him to that how do you make him that enthusiastic like you are in your audiences well there was quite there's kind of like a quid pro quo here between project hubbard and abit symphony because okay. abit symphony is rob's passion project right absolutely loves abit symphony orchestral stuff is what he wants to do Project Hubbard needed to be done, and he got it out of his system. But I had to introduce it very. Um... He wants to be in as well. Yeah, let sure. him in. So, uh, I can bear with me. But sorry, you were saying it was a quick pro quo. That's what we were. So we'll we'll oh, cut back. Yes, the 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 the, the scene made Eight Bit Symphony possible, and that made his dreams possible, and that made making the book easier to write. There are also some other things like Bedrooms to Billions mm -hmm. uh, that had happened and the the good reaction to uh, the good reaction to Project Hubbard. Yeah. And he basically kind of warmed to it, but he still finds it very weird and has to think of that Rob Hubbard as kind of like another person in order to really kind of cope with it mentally. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, having signing 800 books that was that was weird um so it's basically i have to be very gentle on the ideas because if you pitch ideas that are too big you'll get scared okay like back in time life brighton um he, he had cold feet on um until it was until i uh, until a blanket of reassurance was put over it that people didn't really mind about the mistakes and 
you know, that we were recording it, but it wasn't like Channel Four or anything. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine him being uh, being hesitant on some of this, not realizing that the crowd will just accept anything he's going to put in front of them because he would, they would have never guessed he would be back on stage or he would be back available uh, again. I, I think that must be almost surreal at times, I bet. I think so. Although a bit Symphony isn't as popular as it should be, I think, because it's quite far... There, there, there's definitely a group of people, possibly um, less neurodiverse ones, I don't know, or more, <laughs> but who... Who would prefer to fondle a keyboard than to listen to a classical cover of a Commodore 64 tune? Right. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just different. Um, it, it's it, we, we've gone like about maybe two or three steps beyond where their nostalgia thing snaps. They want their nostalgia direct. They want it tactile. They want to smell the keyboard. They want to um, to touch the keyboard. They want to play the game. They they don't want any deviation from that memory. And what we're doing, what I've been doing in the remix thing all that time is deviating from the memory in order to try and discover a deeper truth of the memory. Uh, because a lot of us actually took that, took the, those experiences in and made them into, you know, epics in our mind. And that's, that's the audience. Um, the book um, doesn't have to do that. The book is straightforward. It is what it says in the tin. It writes about the game. People remember the game. They see the screenshots. They can ignore the technical bit because it's not that big. Just like in the actual sound chip books, most of it wasn't even technical. Most of it was just links to to YouTube. <laughs> so I kind of um, I should have I should really have marketed that differently because uh, it looks more technical than it actually is. I could have taken all the information about the sound chips out, and it probably would have sold better if I'd have put it all together in one book. Yeah, but... Got to be true to yourself. Well, I think you say it right as well. I think I think it's it's almost like if people get introduced to these books, they'll find something of their liking that matches with their memory and their fondest part of that memory. Whether it was the coding that they looked at, or whether it was the sound that they loved so much, or the backstory, or just the era. And I think that's the cool piece. But you gotta. You got to be exposed to it for uh, for uh, to be able to appreciate it. If I yeah, I, I mean the book the book is probably the most accessible thing I've done for a while because it, it all it requires is that you remember Rob Hubbard and the rest does itself. You don't you don't need to subdivide the niche, so you don't need to find fans of Rob Hubbard who don't mind remixes, who don't mind orchestral remixes, who don't mind orchestral remixes performed in this way, because I, each time you're you're sli salami slicing the audience. Right. or you're halving the audience or fragmenting the audience and the book doesn't do that uh, the yeah. second book i'm not expecting it to sell as well as the first one because it's more optional mm -hmm. um people might want to read more about Rob Hubbard as a person or to follow his musical thing or to deep dive into the music but they don't have to they could have the first book and be perfectly happy with the rest of their lives that they know Rob Hubbard's entire Sid career, or video game music career. But you, the other, you expect the second book to to come together realistically. How, sorry, when you uh, expect when? a Spellbound, yeah, to to be available. Well, um, it'll that... probably take uh, eighteen months. Eighteen months. Okay. Uh, I think that I, that I ha I do have the luxury now of writing it at my leisure, because the the original book was written having taken the money in 2017, <laughs> delivering a book in 2024. <laughs> so um, I, not that I didn't get a lot done in that time. Other than that, um, a lot of it was spent to waiting around for other people to deliver things that never got delivered, and so I had to do it myself. I never right. expected to write the book at all. That wasn't the, that wasn't what, what I expected. How much more would you have written had you taken more time? Same, um, I, same topic, so not the volume two, which is different, uh, which is a different lens to the same topic, if you will. I don't think I would have written any more. Okay, it, it, it is it is how I how it needed to be, and it's one of the most uncompromised things I've ever done. When you're doing music, there's always more technology. There's always an even more, and there's always more alternative way to do things. There's always more people saying, "Oh, you should do this or that." Um, with the book, there are many less options. 
it's you've got you've got some reviews okay we've got all those you've got some um description you've got all those um you've got rob's town quote and you, you, it's basically a very much more controlled environment and once you've done all the games and you've done that about the games you're done so it was very easy to say this is finished bye uh, you, you said earlier yeah, they, that you said earlier that something had to happen and then recently you just said this needed to be I'm, I'm guessing that you don't have a particular love of writing per se you just are driven to breathe life back into the history and the the chiptunes that are there more more than any desire to write right it's it's the domain that's driving you um yes i think that's true it's because i've, I've no particular desire to inflict my own um my own inner workings on other people uh, it's basically describing stuff enthusiastically as a friend would explain it to them so it's it's, it's driven for by desire to explain things um I, I i happen to have a superpower of being able to sit down and write quite a lot of text in that style very very quickly um which is a it doesn't feel like it because it took seven years but that, but the actual process well, once i was able to disengage from life enough to 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 do the thing it all came together quite quickly like so, the actual the court in three months possibly less so a little shift you have another co-author besides rob hubbard um kenny mcalpine who um yes. google, google tells me that he works at the melbourne conservatorium of music I don't know if I'm still yep. in date or not. Um, he's also at times a professional ludomusicologist, which Yuri could tell you is a fancy term for someone who studies video game music. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell me how you met Kenny and what he brings to your collaborations? He brings an academic frame of mind. I mean, the thing is, I, I commissioned a lot of analysis from him for the first book, which wasn't used because it suddenly didn't fit. There are bits of it. There are bits of it where he pops up and explains. Um, he does a, a musical analysis of Zoids or Master of Magic. Mm -hmm. Most of his stuff is reserved for the second book, which is another reason for having the second book, because I paid for that material. <laughs> um, I, I came across him originally because he was writing a book called Bits and Pieces, and he knew he knew of me. And uh, he was also right responsible for getting Rob Hubbard his honorary degree at Abertay uh, University, so that was nice. Oh, I didn't know that. His honorary yeah. uh, PhD. That's cool. Yeah. What he's mentioned, I'll put a link to this in there as well. This is also a really good book. It's also on chiptunes. Um, very readable. I mean, he's a great thinker. Therefore, he's a great writer. Um, it's yeah. a little bit academic in tone, but is in no way pedantic. It's very enjoyable. I, I think that's one of the reasons. Um, one of the reasons I didn't want to write an academic book, which is that I didn't want to have to justify my opinions by just by the with the fact that someone else believes them who is more important than me i just want to have opinions and use myself as a primary source and if people want to quote that later they can i'm kind of but I, I didn't feel like making it an academic book i have no particular reason to do that but it meant i couldn't get it published as an academic thing even though it's it could probably be very useful as that and a useful teaching thing as well but um so oh, chris about a bit about the current book then eh? the tell, tell us something that really surprised you that you learned while while you were going through this either in the list of games that you found or a game that you'd never even heard of or a tune that you had completely missed or what what, what was something surprising that you learned while writing this oh there was a surprise on every page <laughs> um so uh the, my my favorite story is that what is when Rob Hubbard was called into the studios of Stock Aiken and Waterman and they wanted to do a essentially do a pop single of Crazy Comets and launch him as a major act and uh, it, it there it was all on the table and then they asked him okay um do you own your work and he said well no he does own his work but he didn't know that at the time and yeah. so and then they kicked him out <laughs> so but he's quite pleased about that because um he would have turned into a one-hit wonder. They were, they had visions of him doing crazy comets here on on stage on top of the pops with dry ice, lab coats, surrounded by by girlies. 
So right. um, that would have been kind of embarrassing. Yeah. So it's probably that didn't happen because he would never have ended up at EAE in California having a great time. So, that is just a, what a happy memory indeed. So he did spend uh, with EA indeed. He did he did move to the US. He eventually moved back as well. I presume oh, that yeah. that's something uh, that's something that uh, will get more coverage in the second book as well. I presume because that's a rather large life change, obviously. Well, a third of the book, the the, the current book, is a chunk of um, of about EA, which I, yeah. I made I made that stuff. Um, I. I, I tried to make that stuff as as important to the book as all the Commodore 64 stuff because uh, it's Rob's career here and he spent a lot of time on that and he put a lot of love into it and it, it's not as well known because it was for a different audience in America right and a lot of people here didn't even play the games or see the games or he he was or he was stylized into doing the um the you know the American style TV sports theme tune kind of thing and um and so he wasn't necessarily expressing himself with the freedom that he had uh, in the in the uk so but i did feel that uh, very strongly that there was a need to introduce rob hubbard fans to all of his career and not just the bit they remembered right. so the book has a the book basically has a sudden tone switch from being Here's stuff you already know about and love, and here's why you're right to love it. To look at all this stuff he did, and here's a media gallery. Now go explore. Right. Um, which you is are... Chris, you're clearly the subject matter expert on Rob Hubbard. Can you and you've talked about how his his, his output changed um with the businesses that he found himself in. But stepping back a little bit, how would you describe Hubbard's musical style or what makes it unique or is that question even possible to answer well he one of the things I've got in the in the second book is his his 10 point list of musical rules Ooh. Um, which is quite interesting you want to tease and any of those or you, do we have to wait for a spellbound it's okay if we have to wait well some of it's uh, some of it's obvious like um uh, variations on a theme sure just keep things interesting um also that he, he had a I, I think it's fairer to say that he is a he is a technician as much as he is uh an instinctive musician yeah and yeah. um all, all of his pieces were basically created by improvising then he the, the 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 bits he likes he writes down on sheet music. Then when he's got enough, he goes off to the computer and codes it in. And at the Later same time, that, his his improvising was the fact that he's writing his own sound driver at the same time. So he's there writing code, and he's writing music. The two can influence each other. I mean, I, I imagine the SIDS that people write today um, are in some sense governed by the tools that create them like trackers you know there's a certain interface and if you're using that as your compositional environment um you are in some way influenced by the very tool itself he's building his engine as he's building his music so he's improvising on both those sides like you said that's true well what what he would do is that he, once he had the sketches down he would take that to the computer and then code and then experiment like heck um so what he would do is set a is a set a four bar uh, section going and keep it going and keep it repeating and then go into the machine code monitor and just start um, tweaking stuff in real time that's cool until he had something he wanted then he'd codify that go on to the next four thing for four bar section and and do that and uh, so it, 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 he'd get the notes and the sections then he put the structure of the section so you've got you know, a b c so he was always thinking in those terms in yeah. terms of the structure Song. everything was a song which isn't necessarily true for when you're thinking in terms of sequences small sequences in the tracker so i know um game composers in the 80s uh, would quite often uh, work alone um they, they'd have a contract and they would um get the music done it would be uh very small it would only take up a few cycles and they throw it over the fence to the uh the game company 
Um, mm -hmm. Today, of course, the music people work much more closely and integrate the music with games. Not always, but they have that opportunity to do so. Did did Rob ever have that opportunity to do that uh, back in the day? Not before EA, no. Um, and even then, initially, it was he was kind of um, semi detached. Um, he is in in a sound department with the uh, him being the only person there. Yeah, um, which is interesting, huh? Because in EA, I think EA created a function that didn't exist in the games uh in the game world at all at that moment in time eh? he's the world's first music had dedicated music uh, and sound engineer uh first one uh, that i'm aware of in any of the gaming world well possibly yeah i mean it was interesting that um in order to be, to get him in they had to they had to put a job ad for his post out there in order to justify his visa right get anyone from the us to do it yeah and um i've got a copy of that and that'll be going in the second book that is awesome yeah for a unique uh, unique skill type of uh advertisement so he could come in on a h1b visa to come and work here which is remarkable for a yeah. role that obviously is now much more commonplace in the in the game industry I don't think they quite know what to make of it down at the uh, the green card office. <laughs> I, it's going to make for a fantastic read in the book, I'm sure. So I started going through his music career. And then, of course, I thought, oh, that's going to take me a little while because I know a couple of tunes I really like. And I'm going to make a quick list. And then I got in the big list. And I'm like, wait, what is that one? Oh, he did that one too. And you know, one of the things I noted is... He made some great music for some really poor games. Oh, yes. He was notorious for it, in fact. It's... Uh, him, yeah, him and Martin Galway were credited with saving poor games. It's, uh, it, it's saving poor games. I really like how you put that, because it really is. He had some Mastertronic titles that I'm like, oh, my goodness, those games were terrible, but the music is fantastic. Yeah, oh, well, I mean, you know, the Darlings weren't, like it but everyone thought the last v8 was unplayable i totally agree with you and the music was awesome and, definitely saved the game and knuckle busters is the other the the real uh no one would have bought that if it hadn't had rob hubbard music no oh, one so to totally agree now what what are some of your favorite tunes which one, which ones do you really like out of his repertoire and in, in an as is state, rather than the because I know you you guys worked on a lot of um, redoing some of them for to bring them to stage as well, but in in their original format. Um, Cantilla, okay. some of the some of the happy bluesy stuff like Jerry the Germ, okay. The synth sample too. Obviously, you can't hate thing on the spring, and Monty on the Run was always awesome. Yeah, you could go through the whole list really, but. I mean, um, he did he did a cover of John Williams' theme from 1942, which was really yeah. good. Yeah, I love the version of Zoo Look. Yeah, which was a chain reaction. Um, Delta in game was just mind blowing. Yes, I mean this is best tunes, right? Uh, it's just, I mean, the the book actually tells you which which Philip Glass and Pink Floyd tunes he drew from to create those. Um, which is a Take, send you off in an entirely different direction but the way it was realized and the atmosphere it lent to the game were, was just amazing it's just yeah. a, out, of these, out of all these pieces um do you, do you in your research or your book find any other game composers that were either inspired by or that helped shape their careers uh, all this hubbard music uh there were lots of them um any, anyone who's second generation will point to rob as being the governor um in, including people like Chris Horsbeck, Matt Gray, um, Jason Page later on, graphic music, uh, musician, uh, Barry Leach, who did an awful lot of stuff later on. Um, not Matt Cannon. Matt Cannon was more inspired by Galway, and Tim Follin wasn't really inspired by anyone other than the vinyls in his loft. So... <laughs> <laughs> i like that too dirty secret uh, here yuri is more of a galway guy but um that happens well, yeah I, I i like the letter there was a uh letter sent into one i think it was one of the magazines uh, by galway where galway said oh i heard this tune i first thought it was written by me 
but apparently there's someone else that's pretty decent and it's it's rob hubbard i've got a similar quote in there that was uh when he first heard thing on the spring he realized he had competition <laughs> which is totally so, go away style i mean fred gray said that when he heard um when he heard rob's stuff he knew he had to up his game yeah um, um it's it's more musicians on the set were inspired by rob than weren't i think yeah uh, maniacs of noise were inspired by rob and then lots of people were inspired by maniacs of noise and that became almost the default default music sound for the sid for a fair long while yeah because of uh jch's uh tracker software i think i think i when i went through the list and i did take some notes on a few of them there was there's this uh, game called bump set spike i think it's called it's like a volleyball game mm. and that game is so slow it's even slower than my memory of it i i i, I tried to play it but the song is so good that I, you know, lasted through one game. I, I, I think it's a perfect example of if that had any other tune to it, no one would have bought it. Like, no one. It would have not even gotten a review in a magazine. It would, was that poor. Yeah. And yeah, music a... ages so much better than the games the music belonged to as well. I mean, I think some of these games are really difficult for uh, a modern player to approach. They don't have the modern gaming sensibilities, but the music endures. Yes, it can be just consumed, and uh, this the the there's a general vibe that the Commodore sixty four music has, has aged less badly than the Amiga music, because the Amiga music was using, was using equivalent equivalent but worse technology to today, but the the analog synthesis is analog synthesis. The sounds the I, same today and always. I get that. Uh, I agree. That makes sense. I agree. Yeah, it makes yeah, perfect. It's, it's hard to t tell the young people that computers actually performed the music live back in the day. They were not playing something pre-recorded. It was a performance. That um, was a very difficult thing to explain to a judge in 2008 in Helsinki when there was a lawsuit against Timberland for nicking Acid Jazz Evening for his uh, for his hit, where you had to explain that they hadn't sampled as such because it was like a music box. <laughs> that was being played <laughs> um and essentially he'd used a version a, a music box version of another tune in his tune and it all got really complicated and everyone eventually gave up the, the main the main kicker was that once the case got to the united states they said well it's not registered with the copyright people so it's not protected so most chip music is not copyright protected in in the well in, in this case the sound recording wasn't protected but the music was right and that was a crucial thing because timberland hadn't stolen the original tune he'd stolen a version of the tune and then bought off the composer but not the person he nicked the recording off hmm. so for some of these games sir, because you, uh, throughout the book you see kind of rob learning how to perfect his not just his style but also his technical ability to yeah. uh, to to get tunes out of the machine um he also reuses quite a bit of of the sound of eh? and you spoke about that previously eh? so you'll recognize his style throughout uh, throughout his uh, initial part of his uh, career quite a bit yeah. Um I remember when Eyeball came out which had that sampling in it eh? which was uh, one of the first ones where it was uh, uh, very clearly used to enhance the dr dr dramatic nature of the song if you will. Um how does he look back at that at that learning cycle? Um he used to get up every day and every day loving his job and I uh, used to have uh, get up at 3 a.m. if he thought of a good idea to make his music sound better. He was always studying, always thinking, always learning. I mean, he was living the job rather than it just being a job. For right. David Whittaker, it was just a job. He's yeah. unapologetic about that. He was in there to do a job, get a paycheck, go to the next thing. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it started off with David Whittaker was um, a synth musician and a pretty good one. Mm-hmm. 
that uh, also later became a, a bit of a production line. Yeah. But, you know, uh, I think so. I think Jason Page. No, it wasn't Jason Page. But one of one of the composers he worked with said that the amount of inspiration he had was in, was directly proportional to the amount of money you would give him. Oh wow! Yeah. So like Shadow of the Beast, big paycheck. Yeah. Very well, well Rob was uh, well, Rob was a musician turned gearhead turned musician almost right. Yeah, he was. Um, he had the professional work ethic, but he had the he had the um, he really put the time in and the mental effort. He was right. an amateur with a professional's work ethic, which right. I can relate to. Right. Like I, I made a note here that I, I always thought like the perfect end note for an interview with a Rob or just a story about Rob to me is uh, is Zoid. The music that he did for Zoid. I don't know, for, for whatever reason, every time I hear that tune, I think about it's like the end of the world or the end of something really big or the start of something new. I I, I don't know why. I don't know how it travels in memory like that. Memories... My mom hated that song being played from my bedroom. She's like, turn that down. <laughs> she found that song distressing. Oh, I know we're so I, I used to play commando on, on loop. And man, people hated it. I still play it on loop, and my wife will come in and say, What's that terrible noise coming out of this room? But no by now, surely. <laughs> I, it is, it's part of education. I teach my kids as well. This is Commando. It's an important. It's an important game because of the music. I still suck at the game, but I still like the music. One of my proudest moments in the book was was finding out, working out what day he did that on, what actual day in history he did Commando. Oh, that's interesting because because of the you feel there might be a significance to those dates as well. Oh, not uh, well. I mean, it's it's just being able to narrow it. Down. Famously, he did it in a day. Yeah. Okay. So we know what day of the week he did it. We know what we know what the deadline was for the game. They need to get it ready for a computer show. Mm -hmm. And we knew what games he was working on at the time uh, because of the timeline. And so certain things in the, the in the driver for Commando had to have been present in the game he was either working on or had just finished right and so you could put all that down along with some uh, remedies about oh okay how 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 warm was it, was right. it and uh, was it after live aid or whatever right. and pull it down to the date that it happened and i'm fairly confident about that date yeah that was way That's too that. good of a result for the amount of time that he had to work on it that was very good well luckily he was remixing so yeah, but um, with with, the, with the, the high score theme, he was just um, back in Monty territory, I think, for a bit there. They're, they're very much sister tunes, the, the two high scores. That's why we melded them together into Monty's journey. Do you yeah. think Monty is is his most famous song? What what do you think his his most famous song is? It, it, it's got to be Monty for uh, to be his most famous tune. Yeah, I mean, Sanction is most famous within the scene, maybe Commando, yeah. probably. But in terms of stuff that's his, which would have been on other platforms and which people may have heard of, and with the first thing that made the really, really big impression. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a reason why Monty on the Run is is the, the tentpole piece for A-Bit Symphony. Yeah. Which one is he most proud of? Because that might not be the same. Uh, the original or the arrangement? Well, either one, or both. Um, originals, he's he's really proud of uh, Cantilla. Okay, and That's, that is my favorite uh, symphonic adaptation as well. That uh, well done. He's he's proud of Dragon's Lair too. Dragon's Lair too. Horrible um, game, great tune. There's two tunes in that that uh, two tunes in that that were on Eight Bit Symphony too. There is. Uh, that he's really proud of he, he it's like he he feels like he transcended himself for for a couple of tunes um the plan is because that's a bit that's that's a big massive open orchestral goal and got a goal to do the rest of that there's an open goal mm -hmm. so you put that together with the london symphony orchestra and you've got a kickstarter yeah so that's gonna happen 
that will be Kickstarter number what for you? Oh, I don't know. Nine. Eight. <laughs> so, <laughs> speaking, speaking of Kickstarters, this came out of a Kickstarter. Um, is I know the people that backed the Kickstarter got one of these. Are they still available? Is it still possible to get a physical copy or an ebook copy of this? How do people get a hold of your book? You would go to c64audio.com and buy a PDF. There are, as I'm sitting here, two copy physical copies left in out the of, world out ever. Of, out of how many? <laughs> 1,750. Wow. 1,750 went like that then. Wow. Uh, more or less. I, saw, I sold about 700 through the Kickstarter, and Chris Wilkins sold the rest. Wow. Well, okay. That is impressive. And well-deserved as well. I, I, it's kind of sad that it's, it's um, closed so quickly. It's like I'm sure there must be more than one thousand hundred and fifty Rob Hubbard fans out there, but they're much more difficult to find than right. the ones yeah. we managed to target. Uh, one of the things that's one of the things that's going on right now is that there, there's a there's a, a game called Platypus, which was released in the mid OOS and which was claymation. So the guy had modeled the modeled the ships in clay, digitized them, and then put them in the game. And everything in the game was were like uh, modeled from original clay models. Hmm. And one of the weird things that happened due to people I knew at the time was that the game was absolutely stuffed with Commodore 64 remixes. Out of context. Completely out of context. As just in-game themes. And what happened over the period of time, uh, part of the reason I did that was to, to prove to myself that the music was great outside of its context. And so now that music is beloved in that way to a whole group and different group of millennials. Yeah. Who came across the mini, that mini clip game with its 30 seconds, 30 second versions of the soundtrack um, at the time. And now they're doing a Platypus Reclaid, which is basically Platypus HD. And yeah. they're, they're putting, uh, putting the, 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 um, the, the money I got from licensing the Commodore 64 remixes to them for that paid for 8-Bit Symphony 2 to be pressed because we'd run out wow. of money. So, um, yeah, so, it's just paying Rob and Peter to pay for really. I've told you this before, Chris, but, I mean, this is just another example. If I was to summarize all these decades of activity you've done, what I think your consistent strength is is that you understand the musicality that is sometimes hidden in many of these old chiptune songs. Not all of them. Some of them are garbage. But but you find those gems that some people can't see that. And then you reintroduce it to us in brand new forums like the Platypus thing or at brand new venues like a symphony hall. And you just, um, it's, it's worked very well for you. I think that's your strength. Because I see you doing it's that over right. and over. And in book form it's, as well. It's pretty much why I do what I do is to try, always to try and, introduce it to new audiences and introduce it to old audiences in a new way yeah. um so two more examples are uh, i'm taking the c64 audio stuff to steam mm. and yeah. basically setting up a kind of uh it's almost like an, another naol page yeah if you imagine back in the day on, on, on you had a platform where you put up a single page that was like a exhaustive resource for things yeah, yeah. and some things you could the link list. yeah so yeah, and some of the things you could buy and some of the things you could read yeah. and you could yeah. PDFs and videos and, and this and that. And instead of having to pay to try and get people to your page, the people running the platform make money from what they sell. So they want to introduce people to your stuff. Yeah. And it's kind of like a little, it's away from the rest of the internet. And there's loads of people on there who haven't come our way in terms of like the same Twitter people, the same Facebook people, the same Remix 64 people, and who could also drawn in by other games with a retro aesthetic that you can like connect to and, and publish, you know, it's like games you might like, so you can have a list like that, you know, curated, more curated lists. And just set up an, a center of chiptune excellence with some podcasts and whatever, um, to just sort of grow a new audience and find some of those people that we've lost because there must be more of them um, yeah, or, or new or net new people that new people oh. yeah and and i like i like using a a venue in this case steam 
to tap into a crowd that that you basically have crossover this way yeah and we, we get linked from the web from website of that game which is a good start right. yeah and another way of getting ourselves uh, in on in the middle of january and um, we're going uh, the the prague footage which is like two two hour concerts basically is going to be put onto a platform called symphony.live okay. which is a classical music video on demand platform okay. and it'll be given a proper pr treatment and everything so you, you'll have the, the, pro, the possibility of a drop-down list that goes Beethoven, Mozart, Rob Hubbard. <laughs> so maybe it's... I think it's genius. I think, I think, and with that, you're going to tap into other talent that may come forward as well and say, hey, how can I get involved or otherwise? So it, it, this is, I think it's genius. Yes, because what, what's going to happen then is that Symphony, my, my reason for contacting Symphony.live wasn't to get stuff onto their platform but to get them to disseminate our 8-bit symphony for orchestras link to all their orchestras. Right. The other thing is kind of like an accidental side effect of that. Right. And they're creating, they're creating their own web page for 8-bit symphony, kind of like, um, which will have uh, a curated set of resources like booklets and stuff for people who are for their subscribers. Right. And, and so there's no telling where that's going to lead because that's the kind of thing where you are reaching new people and they're assessing it on its own merits. But we're also putting the, getting a new Monty on the Run video done with the gameplay to go with Rob's score yeah. so that people can have this bite-sized chunk of, of retro that doesn't outstay its welcome and give some context. Hi. It's you like, okay, what, here's the, this is the game it came from. I, I know at one time you were... You were I, I was hearing retirement kinds of vibes, and I think uh, that has been greatly exaggerated. You just have this ever-expanding horizon of new things you seem to be working on. You talked about lots of future plans. Uh, do you have even more future plans than all of this, or is that is your plate full enough with all that, or do you not want to spoil anything else you're working on? Well, um, once we've once I've I, I had bucket list items that weren't complete, um, and kickstarter with london symphony orchestra is one of them mm. another thing made possible by symphony.live um the rest of it is basically stuff which happened to have come about through sheer chance or just because you throw stuff out there stuff comes back so it's basically me being opportunistic but in a good way right. um and so i am never one to turn down an opportunity or a new adventure if it's something i haven't done before and both of these are things i haven't done before and in certain ways, I've got all this, I've got all these resources, and it makes sense to try and instead of like waste, not wait, instead of spending my life creating much more content and never marketing the stuff I've got, to actually repackage the stuff I've got cleverly or to, to yeah. make the most of it. Because it, it, yeah. it, it, it's a shame when a product comes along and then it's, it has a life and then it dies and then no yeah. one remembers it. So it's still good, like Project Cytology. Amazing album. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And yet, you know, it, it's because there was a physical, I've still got too many copies in my, in my shed. Uh, it's a beautiful box. But um, anyway, it's, it's making the most of all the stuff I've got, which is by now runs to terabytes of stuff. Um, and uh, one of the things I was going to offer is for people, for a certain amount of money to be able to have access to my top level root directory on Google Drive. Yeah. Uh, which has an insane amount you could keep it it will keep you busy for years overwhelming Just, amount of information yeah. and content yeah 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 so, it's good it's good and it's especially tapping into um new audiences even with existing stuff just because they missed out on the Kickstarter uh, or something happened in the cd era and they, they didn't even you know they weren't even exposed to that era i think makes a lot of sense and i like the idea of using steam or or a classical music uh, symphony type of uh, platform to tap into audiences that um, very well might appreciate this but never would have known about it because they're not exposed to the niche area where this was marketed initially they don't move in those circles there right. was some came came very recently to buy project Sizology and um I, and he was like oh, i just discovered you and i was going how could that possibly happen how could you possibly I only just discover me i've been doing this for 25 years yeah and he said okay he followed this web pop web pop 
He followed this web podcast and then looked at a Rob Hubbard live performance and then looked at the th- website behind that performance. And I said, well, how could we got to you earlier? He said, well, some of the interests I'm interested in are Raspberry Pis. Give me a list of YouTube uh, channels to, that I really need to get featured on, I guess. Um, real life conspiracy theories, i.e. ones that turn out to be true. <laughs> um, and um, um, science, science fiction collectibles. And that was the kind of, uh, and so they, they, if I'd have had like adverts in any of those places, I would have found him a lot earlier. All right. So there's, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of lateral thinking to be done into, you, you can't just like Facebook advertise to people interested in Commodore 64s because they've all, they all know you exist anyway. Right. And Facebook is a rip off anyway now. So, so I'm hoping Steam will solve a lot of those problems by bringing in new people, giving them a, uh, an ever-growing library of stuff, some paid, some free. We can take the chapters out of context, mix and match chapters, have packages where you have chapters of a, a hardware book and a, a thing book and a video and an right. audio thing. Uh, the, and uh, it's a limitless possibilities, really. I'm quite yeah. fond of limitless possibilities. Are there any questions we would have asked you had we been better interviewers you've been great interviewers okay is there anything you wish we'd asked you that you want to say before we uh wrap this up here no not right now you've been perfect yuri any last comments i i i just i i got this list of games i just want to hear i want to hear something a thumbs up thumbs down give them a quick rating or something okay. like, I'm gonna put you to the test okay I'll, I'll, I, so some of you'll have heard me talk about, others you won't have. Let's start with Eyeball. Give it a rating, one to ten. How am I rating it? No, uh, rating or it originality, off. or saying, or something. Say something that strikes. Uh, Rob Hubbard thought he'd, put, he, he, um, he didn't like the original pop group who did the tunes. He uh-huh. didn't enjoy the music, and he thought he pushed the driver too hard. Also, he didn't do the samples. That was Simon Pick. And they, they just happen to be synchronized at the beginning of the tune, which is why the Sid doesn't didn't used to have them. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, well, that's yes. an interesting tidbit. That wasn't his first sample thing. I, I, I looked into the code and found, yeah, that they'd it, it was basically just um, triggered on a parallel path to his music, but was never in the music. wasn't It, it went nowhere near his driver. Very interesting. See, that's, you've got to read the book to know all of this. And then still you won't have known all of it. Um, international Karate. Um, yeah, not a ripoff. It's a pastiche. And uh, the book has this some cheap music to prove it. I like that. Thundercats. Rob, actually, I was surprised that Rob actually thought this quite, held up quite well because it was from one of his, it was from his burnt out period just before he left for the States. Um, but he thought it held up quite well, especially the bass line. Yeah, I, 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 I really like it. I, I like the percussion. It's yeah. a metallic percussion he's got going there. And yeah, the bass and it does really well still today on the original. It really yeah. sounds very current, if you will. Yeah, he thought it held. I, I got, uh, I got uh, uh, two more. Um, uh, mega, mega apocalypse. He doesn't remember doing it. I mean, he did it obviously, but he was doing it as such a such a it was one of the last things he did before going to the states so he was very distracted and the sample programming was done uh well th- that piece doesn't have samples so it was a, essentially a retrograde step in some ways um because they the, the the game was so busy doing simon nichols really clever five channel sample mixing uh-huh that, but, um there was no space for him. There was no need for him to do samples, so it was a regular tune. Um, he was happy enough with it, but I don't, it's it's not something he's particularly um, attached to. Interesting, interesting. Now, and the last one is, uh, I think, called Confusion. Yeah, um, originally a originally a tune by a pop group called Private Property. Private Property, indeed. It yeah. was set up by friends of uh, the software house guy. Well, and, and included a Matthew Smith who wasn't, uh, who wasn't the Doctor Who Matthew Smith, the Manic Minor Matthew Smith, or the Amiga Format Matthew Smith. Yeah. <laughs> so another, another Matthew Smith. They, they they grow on trees. They come in six packs. See, this is this is so. 
what is amazing about you with everything every time we talk to you is yes you've written it all down because you've done years and years and years of research but you somehow have memorized it all as well you're like a walking encyclopedia and yeah, that tends to happen but I've, I've forgotten most of the sound chip stuff by now so don't ask me about that <laughs> <laughs> information has a half-life <laughs> oh, oh chris it was an absolute pleasure thank you thank you for uh, indulging us yeah and everybody who loves the sid has benefited from your passion over the years so thank you for that and thank you for joining us today oh thank you i hope people uh, had a good time thank you guys see, see you later you. see you later take care <laughs>